key part of Wesleyan pneumatology is how Wesleyan theology incorporates and understands the role of women. So the inclusion of women in ministry from the earliest days of the movement is, was part of the story. And even there was an official role of women preachers within the first generation. And a large reason for this was precisely because of their understanding of the Holy Spirit, West John Wesley's, Charles Wesley's, and how they understood the doctrine and work of the Holy Spirit led them to embrace women preachers in a way that really wasn't happening around them at that time outside of the Quaker movement, who, as I said, also had a very high view of the Holy Spirit, a very integrated understanding of the Holy Spirit. A little background. Some of this is review, but it's worth highlighting even more closely. John Wesley's mother, Susanna Wesley, I'm a big fan, I wrote an article on her. She's an amazing woman. She led a popular Bible study in Epworth while her husband was away in London for several months. She she just took the lead in leading this Bible study and people just kept coming and attending and found space for uh, them all. In, in a short time, over 200 people attended, men and women, and, which was more than attended the Sunday services. So there was pushback against this by the curate. We can maybe call him the assistant pastor in that era. He, he was often the, the preacher, handled a lot of the day-to-day -day work while the person who's, whose parish it was was doing other things or, or it, uh, it was sort of a lesser role, but still important. And he was jealous, to be honest. And so he wrote and asked Samuel Wesley to intervene. He said it violated the Conventicle Act, uh, a, which was a law passed in the 17th century in, in England, which outlawed religious gatherings of more than five people outside of Church Engl of England leadership. And Susanna Wesley wasn't an ordained official Church of England. The pastor's wives didn't have any kind of rights then. And so he said it violated that it could be liable for prosecution. So Samuel Wesley followed up. He wrote a letter to Susanna. He wasn't mad at her, but he said maybe the better part of valor, the keep the calm, uh, it, would, it would be good for her to stop. So he asked her nicely and Susanna wrote back. I did not hear of more than three or four persons who are against our meeting of whom Inman, the curate, is chief. He and Whiteley, I believe, may call it a conventicle. We hear no outcry here, nor has anyone said a word against it to me. And what is their calling it a conventicle signify? Does it alter the nature of the thing? Or do you think that what they say is of sufficient reason to forbear a thing that has already done much good and may, by the blessing of God, do more? <laughs> she doesn't back down. She ended the letter by saying that if Samuel wanted her to stop, he had to command it. He had to order her to stop, not just ask her to stop. So as to put the weight of judgment of Christ on him, not her, for the work being stopped. That's right. Susanna Wesley. We don't know if Samuel ever replied. We don't have any record of that. And the meetings continued. So it seems that it discontinued. That was John Wesley's example. Through the letters, through their interactions, we, we see her just being this strong woman leader and teacher all throughout. And when you have that kind of experience growing up, it's, I had much the same. It's uh, just a natural thing to see women in leadership and in teaching roles because they've already served that role. And so John really was primed to be a participant in the changing experience and to embrace the role of women in the Methodist movement. So Wesley had a strong and clear role model in his mother, and that affected his views on lots of things, and not least of which women in ministry. Susanna was never officially a minister, but she was always a minister to John and Charles and the others. So she was had this unofficial capacity that once that is in place, it's only a, it's a fine line between that and official capacity. So as early as his Georgia ministry in the 17, mid 1730s, Wesley appointed women as deacons for important roles. He said, we referred to the New Testament early church sources for authority in doing the scene women ha having offices, not ordained offices, mind you, at this time, but official offices w within the church structure. Women later served as leaders of bands, which was the Wesleyan Methodist structure of organization with three to four people who, who would talk more intimately in confession. So women served as leaders of bands and classes, which were about 12 people in Methodist communities at first, just leading women, but later expanding to leading in neighborhoods. These bands and classes were geographically organized, and so women leaders would just lead whoever the, would lead within their neighborhood. So no matter who attended, these would be leaders. The initial impulse to make space for women was repeatedly confirmed as some women showed clear ability, extraordinary gifting in these roles and spiritual wisdom in, in their leadership. In, in fact, in 1742, one society, which is a community of many classes, a local community, so like what we would call a church, had 47 women leaders and 19 men. When you give space to the women, they tend to be involved. And as so often women become the chief participants in a lot of church structures and having an official 
space for that within leadership recognizes what's already happened. Women were not allowed to preach sermons at first or, or do formal evangelism type acts in, in preaching, both because of Wesley's understanding of Paul's pro prohibition. So that the, the questions that are still raised in our era were raised then. Paul's seemingly clear statement about not allowing women speaking. And so he, he read that and, and said, well, that's how it is. And also because he didn't want to cause more problems with the Anglican church. He was already running into a lot of barriers and he there was a lot of pushback against him and his ministry and the Methodists. He had never wanted to split off. He saw his work as a reforming renewal movement within the church. But of course, that causes some pushback against those who, who don't think they need to be renewed and are jealous of his successes and so on. So he was already dealing with troubles and didn't want to add more troubles to the list. Unofficially, however, he did not forbid women preachers. So while he didn't officially uh, allow women to preach at first, increasingly there were women preachers who asked him for counsel and he just, he said, use your gifts. He encouraged those like Sarah Crosby in a letter in 1661. Crosby had found herself in a situation not unlike Susanna Wesley where she was leading these classes and found herself in situations where she was the one who, person who was gifted in speaking and teaching and there were men and women there and suddenly she was a preacher and she asked John Wesley what she should do and he basically said if you know you work you have you have a calling but not officially <laughs> uh, but keep doing it however in 1771 he changed his official position he was convinced by Mary Bosanquet that preaching by women should be allowed and even sponsored. So they were given sanctioning by the, the Methodist churches and given official roles as preachers after 1771. Convinced by Mary Bosanquet's scriptural unreasonable argument, she wrote John a letter and argued based out of uh, various passages in the New Testament, again, not unlike we, we still do today, noting that that while Paul was clear in in some passages, he ha there were other passages which added complexity because he allowed women leaders and preachers and others. In fact, one key passage was the idea that that women were prophesying, that that women were ca called to to do tasks like that. And and Mary asked John, "Well, how can you prophesy if you can't speak?" So it, he, she was using very well reasoned exegetical arguments. I mean, it was it's interesting in looking over these again to see that these are the, many of the same arguments that that I. I wrestled with as I became came to my own official position um, soon after college. I've always been uh, open to women preachers, but never had looked closely until my church was engaged in a major controversy at the time. So I did a my own study and uh, came to the conclusion that Mary writes John. I wish I had read this uh, earlier. It would have saved me a lot of time, right? The gifts were recognized because of the effective ministry of the women. That was really fundamentally the case. It, John Wesley was seeing that these women were effective teachers and leaders, you know, not unlike his mother. So he basically said, if if this is already happening, who am I argue, to argue against the spirit? He eventually recognized 27 different women as Methodist preachers. Most didn't have permanent positions. They weren't ordained as, as Church of England ministers, and so they didn't have their parishes. Well, this is, again, not, this wasn't a separatist movement quite yet. Uh, but they did travel, and they spoke at different settings, and, and were official preachers within the Methodist Church. Again, because the Church of England didn't ordain women, all the women were still considered lay workers, though they were, their roles they were given were very expansive as f fundamentally being uh, pastors and preachers. Uh, women also led in a variety of other ways, including at love feasts, which was the, the early church called their communion celebrations love feasts, and, and John Wesley adopted this as a pattern for the Methodist churches again. He didn't encourage separation from the Church of England, so he uh, part of the, the Methodist calling of the time was that you, had, you need to go to your Anglican church every on Sundays and, and receive the official communion. But they had these Eucharistic meals. And, or, they, they wasn't a formal Eucharist, but it had a Eucharistic or, orientation. It wasn't sacramental, but it, it really it functioned in the same role as the early church in terms of a celebration together by those who are committed to the work of Christ, sharing their gifts, sharing uh, their uh, edifying each other. Uh, women were also very important in various social actions, including founding and administration of orphanages, schools for underprivileged children, and so on, as well as preaching, leading class meetings, and other pastoral work. And basically anything uh, men were doing, the women, you could find the, uh, Methodist women engaged in the same thing. Uh, one particular standout 
who I don't spend a lot of time with after this, but is well worth noting, is Lady Selina Huntington, because she was particularly important in the overall Methodist leadership, even as uh, she, her work has somewhat fallen in the background for various reasons. Um, she founded a seminary and she contributed in substantial ways to the leadership of the movement. She was uh, uh, clearly very wealthy and, and socially uh, in a high class, and she used her position to really advocate and was a patroness for uh, the Methodist movement, especially the Calvinist Methodist. That's the key part of why a lot of her leadership hasn't quite had the same resonance as you as you find other places because she was uh, primarily working with George Whitfield and the Calvinist Methodists, which have which uh, after Wesley's death really. Um, separated might be a strong word but but increasingly distant and there's there's really only a s small remnant of them in the overall size of the Methodist Church uh, but again she was a strong patron of Whitfield's ministry she was extremely active in abolitionist and related social action causes whereas John Wesley was both a preacher and a gifted teacher and also a, a tremendous organizer and administrator George Whitfield was a very gifted preacher and teacher but he wasn't an organizer or administrator and uh, Lady Huntington really served that role in that side of the ministry. She was very gifted and inspiring and talented in bringing people together and uh, raising funds and organizing. So she, she and Whitfield together served on in that wing in, uh, in a very, very profound way. Wesley encouraged women to take responsibility over their spiritual lives. He didn't see them as passive and, and to take this responsibility over those around them, becoming active and using their gifts. However and wherever the Spirit led, whether in evangelism, helping the sick, ministering the outcast, wherever they felt called to do, he, he saw the women's calling as being responsive to the Spirit in the same way as anyone else. So he, he, he didn't relegate women to a second class or uh, just in a receiving way or just in a service way. He, he really saw women as, as equal subjects in the Spirit's work. So part of the Spirit's work involves making space for others after all. And so in, in making space for women to participate, Wesley was participating with the Spirit and encouraging women in, these, in the Methodist societies to uh, likewise join in with the overall work. Wesley was also, very interestingly, attentive to language in a way that we think is, is much more contemporary. In his adaption of the 39 Articles, the defining statements for the Church of England theology and polity for American use and for the, his churches there, he began actually a shift to using inclusive language. For instance, changing Christian men to Christians. Now, when we read his sermon, we still see a lot of the, the masculine language and tendency. So, so this was an across the board, but it's interesting to see that he was increasingly attentive to this and, and very forward looking in not only his inclusion, but also in a way how, how language uh, works as, a, as an encouragement or, or as a distancing. Um, sadly, like with the issue of slavery, after Wesley's death, uh, much of the Methodist tradition reverted back to non-inclusive ru rules, uh, taking back on the, the kinds of social structures the rest of society have. In 1803, the British Methodist Church suspended all women preachers and no longer allowed them in that role. So we see really a step back by Methodism, away from formally allowing women preachers a uh, a distancing from the kinds of freedoms, probably, now this is this is bears further study, but my suspicion is, whereas Wesley had a very strong developed pneumatology, in as much as pneumatology itself drifted from the forefront, uh, the social roles likewise reverted back to the, the standard church structures. Uh, it might be an interesting research paper there. Uh, but that said, while all women preachers were officially suspended and and there was no official place, it was that was only loosely enforced. So even non-ordained women um, in the Methodist churches continued to serve informally in assorted ministry roles, including preaching and teaching. Uh, the Wesleyan Church, founded in the 1840s um, and c combined with the Pilgrim Holiness Church uh, in the uh, late 60s, uh, but the Wesleyan Church is actually one of the first 
denominations to give official ordination to women. The first superintendent of the Wesleyan Church actually participated in the first official ordination of a woman. It was before he was a superintendent, but he was a, a major part in that ceremony. And so we see these holiness movements, and the Wesleyan Church in particular, from the very beginning officially giving place to women beyond just a uh, either unofficial rules or just uh, uh, you know language so this actually continues to be part of their denominational expectations candidates in the wesleyan church are, and among others i just know more, a little bit more about this one having uh, walked through this candidates are explicitly asked if they support women in ministry they part of the uh, interview process and application is do you support women in ministry and if you say no then that's a barrier to to participation in the church uh, it's uh, probably also helpful to know just not directly connected to Wesleyan theology but Fuller is the same way where those who work for Fuller are explicitly asked if they support women in ministry and have to answer yes as part of their uh, work at Fuller which is why I like working at Fuller